Hey, come see us on tour. We're going to be in Los Angeles, Columbus, Ohio, Dayton, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Lexington, Kentucky, Burbank, California, and Honolulu. Go to jimmydoor.com for a link for tickets. And I wanted to talk to everybody about what's happening right now. There's a BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South America are joining together to oppose the the West, the United States, because we're using the dollar as a weapon, at which we've talked about on this show many times before, because the United States dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Now, everybody in the world is afraid we're going to sanction them, which is what we've been doing all over the world, including with Russia. And so they're having a big meeting right now in Moscow. Putin gathers allies to show West pressure isn't working. And just so you know, the world is changing. So there they are. That's uh, uh, They're all getting together. And I just uh, want to bring on someone who knows about this. Uh, Mark Sloboda is an independent Moscow-based international affairs and security analyst. He's also a former nuclear reactor operator for the United States Navy, as well as a contributing political analyst at the RT Network. He previously served as a senior lecturer and researcher of sociology at the Moscow State University. Welcome to the show, Mark Sloboda. Jimmy, thanks for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be on the show. So this is, uh, it's great to have you. I'm glad. Thanks for making time for us. I really appreciate it. I know it's early there. And uh, so uh, this is because the United States, this is what they said was going to happen if Trump was president, that he was going to push our enemies closer together. He was going to make our friends turn away from us. That's exactly what's happening because the United States is a warmongering like crazy and uh, they're weaponizing the dollar. And the irony is, is that the United States is such a such a chauvinistic country that uh, they thought they they almost begged, they almost bullied Russia into doing this. And I'm going to show you if this is a 40 second clip of Joe Biden. I think this was from like 2007. Let's watch this. Our conversation was that Ganoff was repeated with Lebed. They talked about they don't want this NATO expansion. They know it's not in their security interest and on and on and said, well, and if you do that, we may have to look to China. And I couldn't help using the colloquial expression from my state by saying to Zaganov, lots of luck in your senior year. Um, you know, uh, good luck. And if, not, if that doesn't work, try Iran. Um, and uh, I'm serious. I said that to them. And these were very, and, and, and they know, I knew, they knew, everybody knows that that is not an option. And everybody knows, every one of those leaders acknowledges and needs, and they resent it. But they need, they need to look west. And the question is, whether well, this is designed to completely shut them out, but not in terms of- So there's Joe Biden. And now this, this just uh, happened a few hours ago. Russia's President Putin has been gifted a mock-up of a BRICS bill at BRICS summit in Kazan. So let me, so Mark, tell me what is happening with BRICS. Is it, is, uh, is it the beginning of the end for the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency? And uh, will BRICS bring nations together that are normally not friendly to each other in opposition to the United States economic hegemony. Okay, so first of all, it has already brought countries that have issues with each other, right? The original core members of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, India and China have lots of lots of issues, right? Um, uh, some border issues uh, on an uninhabitable plateau in the Himalayas that may have been settled just before this, but there's still geopolitical uh, tensions there. But um, at last year's summit, BRICS was expanded, right, by four new members, including uh, Iran, Ethiopia, um, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia is still kind of uh, sitting uh, on the fence there. Uh, but, um, you know, these are a wide spread of, of geopolitical uh, uh, countries around the world. And there are some nearly 40 countries that have, uh, you know, literally uh, put forward an application to join BRICS, right? There, there's there's a, a storm at the door. And the reason is because of the West's tight control of the global financial uh, and economic architecture, um, which in such institutions set up by Britain Woods, like the World Tra- uh, the uh, uh, World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, there has been, shall we say, 
unequal representation and leadership, meaning the West is no longer the dominant uh, economies of the world to such a degree, but they're preventing other countries from having a role in the decision making process. Uh, plus the overuse of sanctions, uh, tariffs, uh, and other measures by the U.S. to try to uh, contain uh, global control, uh, their hegemony economically, and particularly against Russia, this weaponization of the SWIFT uh, financial telecommunications system and other measures has lots of countries very uh, uh, nervous because what can be done to Russia could also be done to them. So tell when we're talking about a currency, Putin made clear that that's down the road. That's we're on baby steps yet. That is a potential uh, far down the road, but that there's not that uh, initiative being made quite yet. So t can you explain to people what the SWIFT banking system is and how the United States uh, kicked Russia out of that, uh, being able to use that? Can you explain what that is? Sure. It's the, uh, the, the an acronym is the Society for Worldwide Interbank financial tele telecommunications. All right, so banks talk to each other electronically through uh, encrypted, secure uh, computer uh, systems and software. That, that's basically what it is. It's based out of Belgium. It's been set up since 73, but the US and the EU have tight control of it. Um, and but it is anytime inter uh, border trade is conducted, something like uh, nearly 90% of uh, international trade is conducted through the SWIFT systems, whereby banks in different countries that are part of the system talk to each other. Uh, so uh, the right at the start of the Russian intervention in the Ukrainian civil conflict in 2022, uh, the U.S. reacted very quickly to order SWIFT to kick uh, Russian banks uh, out of the system to severely limit Russia's ability to trade with other countries. Now, uh, alternatives were found uh, rather quickly, uh, but um, that is probably the major thing that is being worked on in BRICS right now is creating an alternative to the SWIFT system that operates with the BRICS central banks completely independent and trading in their own currencies and digital currencies rather than the dollar. Uh, and that will be an alternative to a major measure of economic control that the U.S. and Europe now have on much of the rest of the world. So how does how is Russia con operating an economy if they don't have access to SWIFT? Uh, because they're making bilateral uh, transactions, right? Uh, uh, individual banks are talking to individual banks rather than relying on the SWIFT system. And when they can't use the dollar, uh, at, not only when they can't, but there is a, a specific initiative to stop using the dollar completely in trade. Right now, Russia and China, you know, two of the world's major economies, right? Uh, Russia, uh, the International Monetary Fund just revealed has is now by uh, purchasing power parity the fourth largest economy it has knocked off uh, both germany and japan now uh, really uh, during the period of u.s sanctions against them it's now uh china the u.s um uh um china the, the u.s india and now russia uh, so the fourth largest economy, Russia has jumped two places in the last two years. Uh, so, so much for being able to uh, uh, crush the Russian e economy in that measure. Uh, but so many countries want Russian commodities, oil, gas, metals, grain, everything. They find ways of working outside of the dollar and outside of the SWIFT system because these are all finite commodities. Everyone needs them. And uh, you, you can't just take them out of the global market, despite the, we the U.S., the West best attempts to do so. So now there are 30 countries participating in this SWIFT summit and 20 heads of state. But yes. there's but there's still only what, six members of BRICS? Is that true? nine? There's there's nine permanent members of BRICS now as of the, this year. Right. And who would those um, who would those be? Could you tell me? Yeah. 
uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Iran, um, uh, da, 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 Turkey, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Oh, really? Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, is uh, sitting on 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 the fence uh, on that. Uh, they they've been offered uh, in invitation. They are participating, uh, but their the Saudi uh, legislative body hasn't ratified it. Uh, so, uh, but right now there's actually kind of disagreement already within BRICS about further expansion uh, with India and Brazil um, uh, kind of wanting to slow things down in terms of expansion and which countries are allowed in. For instance, uh, Brazil is now very much against Venezuela joining. So So it seems to me like that would be a way. So it seems like to me Lula is under the thumb of the Western economic hitmen. And more so than b- b- during his previous presidency. I think he's much more cautious about bucking the U.S. after spending time for, um, you know, bull feces, uh, corruption charges uh, in prison. That, yes. So, you know, so they threw Lula in prison and they thought that the center right candidate would win that election in Brazil. And then the far right guy won, which was Bolsonaro, who yes. a lot of people say can compare is like the Trump He's a disruptor. He's like the Trump of Brazil. And so they, the establishment didn't know what to do. So what they had to do was let Lula back out of prison because he's the only one who could beat Bolsonaro at the ballot box. So they did that. And uh, then they immediately staged their own version of January 6th in Brazil. And uh, they had a big uh, uh, riot at the Capitol. They then outlawed Bolsonaro. They said that he engineered it, just like they said Trump did, even though it was the FBI that engineered it, Nancy Pelosi, in this show's opinion here in the United States. And uh, and now Bolsonaro, he's made illegal from running for president again. So And then you hear uh, Lula saying all this garbage about the elections in, in Venezuela, which par- it's the the State Department in the United States, which that's always a red flag. So they've got them. And, you know, Joe. It, yeah. Jo- go ahead. Lula was supposed to be at the summit as well, but evidently he fell in the shower and hit his head and couldn't show up. He, he fell and couldn't get up again, I guess. Uh, and so that's another way for the United States to control BRICS. They can control it from the inside because they now have yes. con- they now have control over Lula and they're a big player. For instance, Argentina didn't join uh yep. and now they have uh, Malay. What's his how do you say his name? Malay, I believe. Malay, right? So now he's a big he loves he's a puppet of western economic uh hitmen and uh if they were in in, in already joined uh, bricks. He could then be a tool to stop the expansion and kind of upset things. Ab- and, right. Absolutely. And take a look at two of the other new members, uh, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. Egypt is one of the biggest recipients of U.S. military aid yes. every year going back decades. And the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, by the way, both both host thousands of U.S. troops at bases in those countries. Right. So on on one hand, right, it could be a potential Trojan horse. The U.S. can exert pressure on them. On the other hand, it sh- also shows us that long-term U.S. allies are looking for options, right? That, because, that's another thing that it shows us. That, be, because that, they're uh, afraid that they could be next, right? Like we yes, could- everyone's afraid they could be next, right? I mean, meaning next for the United States to sanction. Yes. Yes, yes, to to uh, and very few countries uh, in the world. In fact, I don't believe any other country is as well positioned to withstand U.S. economic and political pressure like Russia. Well, right? it's being uh, the largest country in the world. I did not know they moved up two positions on the world. Yes. Econ- that, that is a and this is after, you know, we're supposed to be destroying them economically. We kicked them out of SWIFT. We're doing unbelievable sanctions. We blew up their Nord Stream pipeline, which was a major revenue source for them. And but it, what well, all it actually ended up doing was hurting Germany and Europe's economy. Correct. Russia's Russia's economy grew faster than the U.S.'s last year. That is and you're absolutely right. The deindustrialization of Germany as a result of no longer having access to cheap 
reliable Russian gas to fuel their economy. It's dragging all of Europe into uh, an economic doldrums. So do do you see any signs of Europe uh, turning against the United yeah. States? I, I don't Absolutely either. Not. Why Absolutely is this? Not. It's because the current EU foreign policy elite, I believe, has been mentally colonized by U.S. neocons. We've heard Joseph Burrell, who is the high foreign po- was the high foreign policy muckety muck uh, of the EU. He, he uh, resorted uh, a, a couple years ago to a lot of rhetoric referring to the EU as a garden, right? And the rest of the world is a jungle that needed to be pruned, right? This type of and he was. It was clear he was really actually talking about Africa, which is incredibly racist. But this type of jungle and garden rhetoric, this is literally after uh, Robert Kagan's book titles. Robert Kagan is the arch neocon of neocons in the United States. By the way, the husband of Victoria Newland previously of the U.S. State Department under multiple administrations. And he's not the only one. We see a lot of these EU foreign policy uh, uh, and, and political elites quoting Robert Kagan, which is just mad. It's insane. And this, these U.S. foreign policy, the e- European foreign policy elites right now, they literally are happy about their place as important vassals of the United States in U.S.-led Western global hegemony. They want to be properly governed by the United States. They're, they're willing vassals. You would think that the, the business leaders in Europe would have some input in this and that they would want to shake off the United States' control. What? You you would think so. And and certainly within Germany, it was the business community to a very do- a large degree that pushed to have the Nord Stream 2 pipelines uh, uh, constructed in the first place. But the result of, of just being shut out of this process now, of, of the political process, is that Germany's biggest economic um, uh, companies – they're moving to the United States. So the U.S. actually benefits. There's a huge um, um, uh, emigration of uh, high energy cost companies out of Germany to the U.S. because in relative terms, comparatively, energy costs in the UA, uh, U.S. are much lower than they are in Germany. So, for instance, some of Germany's biggest uh, chemical and manufacturing uh, companies have in the last two years moved to the United States. So it, it's really I, I, it's a kind of sadomasochism, I think, by Europe, where they're, they're literally inflicting damage on themselves. Uh, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, said with these U.S. sanctions, uh, with, with these U.S. Uh, pressured sanctions that Europe has agreed to on Russia, that it's not that uh, Europe has shot itself in the foot with the sanctions, but that Europe has shot itself in the lungs with these sanctions. Uh, you know, to put it into context of how import, how much damage it has done to the European economy. So, um, and this is something that so. Well, here's Putin. I just want to show what Putin said today at the BRICS summit. And he's talking about the U.S. dollar and how uh, that this isn't voluntary. They're not going off the U.S. dollar voluntarily. They're being forced to do it by the United States and the hegemons economically. Here, let's listen. He says, thank you. You said that the dollar is used as a weapon. Yes, absolutely. We see it like that. I actually think this is a big mistake of those who does this because the use of the dollar, and it is still the most important instrument of world finance, using it as a means of achieving political goals undermines confidence in this currency and reduces its capabilities. But it's not us who does that. Other people do that. We don't refuse it. We do not fight the dollar. But if we are not allowed to work with... Hang on. But if we are not allowed to work with, what should we do? We are forced to look for other alternatives. That is going on now. So 
he he had one more thing to say about it here. Uh, he's talking about de-dollarization, and let's listen to what he says. There's a you could turn it up because there's a, a translator. You say we need to be more active. Uh, how? I think making too much fuss is uh, inappropriate. We're taking individual steps, one after another. As regards the finance, we did not drop dollars in the, the dollars, the universal currency. It wasn't us. We were banned and barred from it. And now 95% of all the external trade of Russia is denominated in national currencies. They did it themselves with their own hands. They thought we would collapse. No, we haven't. You say so. So he's saying they thought that we didn't do it, and now we have to con we have to conduct all our trade in national currencies, like you explained earlier. And so, well, let me just put show this one tweet. So it's like someone leaving you out and thinking you're going to come back begging, but you got better without their influence. The Russian economy got better. It grew faster than the United States economy. This is one of the best explanations for de-dollarization I've ever read so far from the Russian uh, President Putin. The West took Russia off swift. Russia's currency went up. And so here's all the... BRICS countries now. The, so the green ones are the originals and the light green are the people who want to join. Um, and the these are the newly added. Uh, so anyway, um, do you, how long do you think, Mark, it will be before BRICS actually puts a dent in the in Americans economy? And 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 do you think this is really the beginning of the end for the United States hegemons? Okay, so first of all, I want to say that Putin is actually being a little subtle there because it's true that Russia and China for years have been slowly starting to think and to begin processes of, of moving away from the dollar because they already could tell the sanctions and blackmail potential. But it's certainly clear that since 2022, well, there's, there's an acceleration, right? There's an absolute necessity. So it has been done. Uh, much more quickly. Um, we, well, if you take a look at the BRICS countries now, their share of the global economy is now significantly bigger than the G7, right? The G7 now are only 30% of the global economy all put together, while the BRICS are over 36%, right? So already there's a a, a more global trade having within the BRICS countries than within the established, you know, G7, the the the, the top of the West, uh, if you will. Um, you know, at, and it's it's not so matter of BRICS putting a dent in the U.S. and the Western economy. At, you've got members like uh, like India and Brazil who are very clear that they. You know their vision of BRICS, at least, and it's a consensus-based organization, is not to be an anti-Western organization. It's simply, as Putin said, an organization that does not include the West. But because the U.S.-led West is bent on hegemony, they view any type of organization that they don't have control over as a threat, right? So they're they're already seeing it as a as a threat. So as they attempt to tighten the screws on countries, right, because the sanctions against Russia aren't working, the U.S. Has, and Europe have resorted to secondary sanctions, where they now try to sanction the rest of the world, India, uh, other countries, to force them to stop trading with Russia. That only encourages more and more countries to work outside the dollar, to trade in each other's currencies, to join BRICS. And of course, that's one of the big things BRICS has done, right, is to um, facilitate its members trading with each other outside the use of the dollar. And the U.S. economy, right, with its uh, what is it, 35 trillion dollars of national debt, yeah, yeah. right, it's its entire Potemkin economy is constructed on the rest of the world 
using the dollar as a reserve currency. That's what allows the U.S. to play this game called quantitative easing, that anytime they need more money, they just print it because they know it's in high demand. Well, the clock is ticking on that. And it may be a long time until the dollar collapses completely. But there is no doubt that in the last, you know, uh, since 2022, uh, when the U.S. resorted to this nuclear economic option to try and failing to crush the Russian economy, that it has accelerated. Right. There's no doubt whatsoever uh, about it. And all of this excitement about BRICS, this long queue at the door, uh, it BRICS is the clearest sign of that. And so would you say. So it's a definite mistake and a miscalculation of the neocons that are running the country right now uh, to try to sanction Russia, kick them off swift. They thought Russia was a lot weaker than they were. Yes. And they thought that. Russia would collapse and they'd be able to balkanize it, break it up and sell it off yes. to BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street, just like they're doing to Ukraine right now, correct? Yes, they they absolutely believe that. That was a clear Biden foreign policy. I can remember Jen Psaki talking about the ruble being rubble. And I'm thinking, you're rubbish. Uh, when I was <laughs> here hearing her say this, they believe, the Biden administration believed that they could, uh, one, during Biden's four years, uh, crush Russia quickly in Ukraine, provoke them into this, crush their economy with sanctions that would lead to regime change in Russia. They could then, as you said, balkanize, divide up the country, then uh, pivot hard to China and confront China hard right, militarily, right, in the, the South China Sea and the Taiwan and Straits, and ignore the Middle East, right? They thought they could ignore the Middle East, the Middle East would stay quiet. And as, you know, British political philosopher said, events, my dear boy, events. Well, they didn't crush Russia, the Middle East didn't stay quiet, and, and they can't even pivot their head to China at this point because everything else on their foreign policy agenda has collapsed. So, okay. Um, what well, when you say it's a long way off before the it could be right? We, we there's this idea that you know it's the dollar's dominance will seem inevitable. I mean, it will seem you know very hard to erode. It will seem indomitable, and then but the collapse may come very quickly. So. Um, some black swan event could trigger it to happen much more quickly. Uh, similarly, in a, a, a further overreach, right, against another country of sanctions and, and cutting off of, of from the financial architecture of the world, that could also facilitate it even faster. But it's still true that the majority of global trade uh, is happening with the dollar. It's just less than before. And once this al BRICS alternative to SWIFT uh, comes online, that will help uh, it process even faster. Okay. Uh, Mark Sloboda, I appreciate uh, your insight into what's happening. Uh, obviously, the United States sees BRICS as a threat, even though BRICS isn't as explicitly anti-Western organization, but... We'll see what happens. It's uh, it's in you know Saudi Arabia has started selling gold. Uh, I mean, started selling oil in other denominations besides the U.S. dollar. So the petrodollar seems to be going away, which is a big deal for underpinning the uh, uh, the U.S. dollar. Ag again, I'm uh, it's it's a it's a big reason why <laughs> I'm putting my retirement money in gold, and <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, I I I can I see I don't know how long how. You know, it's like things happen very slowly and then they all happen all at once, right? And so that you're right, some black swan event could happen, and you know, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, the people who are running the Western economy, I have no faith in them whatsoever. The neocons that are doing endless wars, we're bankrupting. We're we're in the end stage republic, is what it looks like to me, and we're bankrupting our empire the same way all empires ended by overextending militarily of, on foreign wars, while we defund our own people. 
Take so, a look at the uh, the papers, uh, the the newspapers, the broad news broadcasts in the U.S. and in the U.K. elsewhere in the West, and see what insane gymnastics they're jumping to this week to refuse to say the word BRICS. Right? They can't acknowledge it that it's an organization that is forming alternatives to you at Western control of global finance and potentially an alternative global order at the end of the day from the rules based order. <laughs> we make the rules. We give the orders. Um, they, they just refuse to say the name. Right. It's it's like almost like a, a secret editorial crib note shared among all the papers in the world. And you opened it up with the BBC saying Putin gathers allies to show the West pressure isn't working. Well, it does show that, but that's not why they're gathered together. There's real, you know, potentially world shaking processes underway. And the West is playing see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, because they refuse to acknowledge that it's happening. And that's what that headline says right there. They won't mention bricks. Just I didn't realize that. That's a, Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, uh, Mark Sloboda, I really appreciate you uh, coming on, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. Okay. Hey, come see us on tour. We're going to be in Los Angeles, Columbus, Ohio, Dayton, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Lexington, Kentucky, Burbank, California, and Honolulu. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for tickets. Mm -hmm.